This is an English language typewriter. It has 26 keys for letters and 12 keys for numbers, symbols, and punctuation. Two keys to shift from lowercase to uppercase. Push a letter key and the typewriter automatically types out the corresponding letter. Pretty simple, right? Because the English language is phonetic, this typewriter allows you to write out any English word you could possibly think of. This is a Chinese dictionary. Unlike English, the Chinese language is made up of square-shaped logograms, consisting of different strokes in different positions and different orientations. They are all unique glyphs, and there are over 50,000 of them. Imagine, it's the early 1900s, and you're a young Chinese engineer trying to come up with a typewriter for the Chinese language. How would you go about doing it? First, although there are over 50,000 characters in the Chinese language, only about several thousand are used regularly. After researching, you find out that most printing presses at the time make do of about 5,000 characters. Now that we've set our sights on 5,000 characters, we should start thinking about how to organize them in a way that's conducive for typing. Before we get started on this, it would be pretty helpful to learn how a typewriter actually works. First, we have the keys, which is where the letters, numbers, and syllables are. Next, we have the carriage, which is the part that holds the paper. The paper is wound around a cylinder, which keeps it tight while typing. As for the typing itself, when you strike a key, the corresponding type bar attached to the end of the key swings up. At the end of the type bar, the corresponding letter slug strikes the ink ribbon, leaving the letter on the paper. Now, because the letters and symbols in the English language are limited, around 40 or so, all the type bars can be elegantly stored in a central location. Now imagine trying to fit 5,000 type bars in there. Forget QWERTY, there is absolutely nothing that would save the absolute pain in the derriere this would cause. Now let's go back to the problem at hand. Clearly, we can't design our 5,000 character Chinese typewriter using this method. Luckily for you, you stumble upon a pre-1900s typewriter designed not by a Chinese person, but by an American missionary based in China. Develo Sheffield, a Presbyterian missionary from New York, was frustrated that there was a language barrier between him and his Chinese scribes. A scribe is someone who writes down what you say. And yes, this used to be an actual job. This language barrier often produced inaccurate transcriptions of the gospel of the Lord, a big no-no. So Sheffield set out to create a device that would stamp out Chinese characters without needing a Chinese scribe. This is what he came up with. Imagine a metallic Lazy Susan, the kind of rotating tables you find at Chinese restaurants. From the center, concentric circles fanned out with Chinese characters inscribed on them. Each character on the Lazy Susan had a corresponding metal cast of the character on the opposite side, the bottom of this metallic Lazy Susan, if you will. The carriage holding the paper was placed underneath the Lazy Susan. To type with the device, you use your left hand to search for the character and use a long, thin pointer to select it. Then, with your right hand, you place the paper tray beneath the character and a small hammer forces the paper to meet the metal cast on the other side. Operating this device was a painstaking process. First, each character had to be inked individually right before using them. Second, the entire device had to be reset to its original location after using one character. And third, uncommon characters were located very far from the operator, meaning you had to use your entire body to reach some of them. As impressive as this device was, it didn't become a standard for Chinese typewriting. Again, Sheffield created this device because he didn't want to rely on a Chinese scribe, and this would have definitely solved his problems. However, the point of a typewriter is that it revolutionized writing. It had to be small, it had to be fast, and it had to be efficient. As an engineering student, you wanted to create something that would be truly revolutionary for Chinese typewriting to bring China to the 20th century. Instead of creating a rotating Lazy Susan where you had to visually spot each character and rotate to it, you decide to place all the characters on an X, Y axis with each character having its own coordinate this would make for easier lookup. You think back on the elegant Remington typewriters that connected 26 letter keys to 26 letter slugs. Obviously, you couldn't make 5,000 of these individual letter slugs, but you start thinking, why are posters rolled up when they're being carried? Because it significantly decreases the surface area. You can fit a lot more things in a smaller space. You decide that the same principle can be applied to your Chinese typewriter. 
you decide to affix the character cast to the curved surface of a cylinder. By using this method, you end up fitting 1500 characters on the cylinder. But 1500 characters are not enough for Chinese, so you decide to 4x the cylinders. This way you have 4000 Chinese characters. Now each character on the viewable type bed is connected to one character cast on one of the four rotatable cylinders. When you find the character you want, you press a lever on the type bed and the cylinders rotate to the correct position and the corresponding character cast would make an imprint on paper. Congratulations! You have now become the first Chinese person to create a Chinese typewriter. You also have a name. I didn't mention it earlier, but the protagonist of the story is a real person. And that person's name is Zhou Hou Kun. In 1916, Zhou Hou Kun was a 27-year-old engineering student from Wuxi, a city near Shanghai. He was one of the first Chinese nationals to study abroad in the US. An engineer of considerable talent, Zhou Hou Kun had just graduated from MIT with a degree in aeronautical engineering. At that time, America was light years ahead of China in technology, manufacturing, transportation, literally by all conceivable measures. Do you stay in America where you'd be considerably more comfortable or do you return to your home country to try to mass produce your beloved Chinese typewriter? At that time, a leading publisher in China, the commercial press in Shanghai, had offered to manufacture Zhou Hou Kun's typewriter, so he decided to go back to China. However, he regretted his decision almost as soon as he set foot in the typewriter workshops in China. According to Zhou, the gears being cut were like the ragged teeth of an old Chinese lady past 60, not precise like the workmanship he was used to in the United States. Man, that's really harsh words there. <laughs> After visiting 10 workshops in 10 months, Zhou could not find anyone that could faithfully reproduce his original prototype. Specifically, he couldn't find anyone that could make the character casts on the cylinders detachable. He decided to appeal to the commercial press to let him go back to the US and manufacture the typewriter there. Unfortunately, the commercial press decided that offshoring manufacturing to the US was not an economical choice. In the end, Joe was severed from his contract and the blueprints of the typewriter now belonged with the commercial press. Luckily for the future of the Chinese typewriter, there was no lack of Chinese talent eager to tackle the problem that Zhou Hou Kun left behind. After Zhou left the company, a Shanghai native by the name of Shu Jindong entered the company and picked up where Zhou left off. He made quite a few changes to the original design. Shu Jindong decided to eliminate the cylinders completely, and this was a major reason that Zhou had to leave because nobody could produce the cylinders the way he wanted to. So by eliminating the cylinders, we significantly decrease the amount of characters that can be outputted by this typewriter. But pros and cons, right? In the end, Shu Zhendong edited the design to make all of the characters in the visible type bed movable. And instead of the characters being connected to type bars, each character visible to the viewer was the actual type bar of the character. When you hit the lever on the character, the selection lever picks up the character cast and swings it up to meet the paper. And after the key is released, the character cast automatically snaps back into place. Although the design only allowed for 2,500 characters, the character casts were immovable, meaning they can be swapped out for different characters when needed. Shu Zhendong's altered version was considerably easier to manufacture. And eventually, the commercial press was able to take Shu Zhendong's altered version to press, so to speak, making the Shu style typewriter the first mass produced Chinese typewriter in the world. This typewriter would be heavily used in the 20th century. Different companies would make their own versions, but in the end, they were all slightly altered versions of the design that Zhou Hou Kun and Shu Zhendong co designed. And this is where you expect the story to end. However, fact is often stranger than fiction, especially in this story. Although Zhou Hou Kun and Shu Zhendong designed a typewriter that could reliably spit out 2,500 characters, the process was by no means easy. As all 2,500 characters are physically visible on the type bed, you had to visually find each character before moving the cursor there. And this was an exercise in eye power and patience. Using the machine means you had to constantly refer to a cheat sheet to figure out where each character was located. Later variations of the machine would have commonly used characters placed near each other, which led for faster typing, but this was still much slower than using a QWERTY keyboard. 
one man felt that there was a better way. Born the son of a pastor in Fujian province, Lin Yutang grew up immersed in Western classics, not Chinese ones. Therefore, he was able to view the problem of the Chinese character from both an outsider's and insider's perspective. Many before him tried to break down Chinese characters into components. In Chinese, we call them radicals, or pianpang bushou, or assembly bushou. In the highly venerated Kangxi Dictionary commissioned by Emperor Kangxi in 1716, there are 214 radicals that organizes the characters, and the radicals are organized by number of strokes. Despite this radical organization system, Chinese and Western typewriting experts tried for decades to break them down in a way that was organizable on a keypad for a typewriter. None of them were able to do so. But Lin Yutang was different. He saw the beauty of the English alphabet. A always came before B, which always came before C. There was an easy way to organize each and every English word in a dictionary. Why couldn't you do the same for Chinese? And so he looked deep within Chinese characters, trying to find an order to them. To non-Chinese people, Chinese characters look basically like a random combination of strokes in different locations. However, a Chinese person sees them slightly differently. Any person who grew up within the Chinese tradition knows that each character has a specific, incontrovertible way that it's written. Let's just take an example. In English, you're taught to write the A, starting from the top, going down to the left, down to the right, and then a line in the center. But you don't have to do it this way. You could draw an upside down A, like this. And your English teacher probably wouldn't scold you unless it looked really bad. However, Chinese is different. Thousands of years of calligraphy tradition has ingrained in all Chinese people the specific stroke order of each and every character. It's not a suggestion, it's an order. Chinese characters fit inside a square grid. For every character, the writing starts at the top left of the grid and continues until it reaches the bottom right of the grid. This is the way of the Tao of the character, so to speak. Thus, Lin Yutang used this stroke order as a starting point of his revolutionary typewriter. He found that you could organize every character using this method. So this probably sounds very foreign to you, so let's try to imagine English using this method. Imagine that English didn't have an alphabet. There is no A, B, C, D. There is no order to the letters. How would I tell the typewriter to retrieve a specific letter I'm thinking in my head? Well, we can actually break down the Latin alphabet into strokes as well. So let's say I want the letter D. I want the letter D. Okay, so what can I do? I can tell the typewriter to give me a straight vertical stroke. If I do that, the typewriter would spit back these options. B, D, E, F, H, I, K, L, M, N, P, R. Okay, that's quite a lot, right? But let's say for the second stroke, I want to stipulate, because, you know, the D looks like this, right? I can stipulate that the second stroke has to be a curved stroke. Now we're down to B, D, P, and R. Much closer to our goal, right? Now, for the English alphabet, this seems like overkill, and it probably is, but not for the Chinese language, where we have tens and thousands of characters, many of which look quite similar. Lin Yutang published this system for managing and retrieving Chinese characters in 1917, and this is right around the time that the Shu Zhendong typewriter took off. But given the success of the Shu style typewriter, Lin Yutang knew he had to perfect his typewriter. In doing so, it took him almost 30 years to accomplish this feat. Amidst the instability in China, Lin Yutang traveled around the world where he wrote and translated novels and articles in both Chinese and English, and many of them were quite well received and he used the sales of these books to fund his passion project his chinese typewriter at long last in 1947 he finally finished the prototype of his typewriter which he called the ming kui meaning clear and fast for his prototype he simplified the input process greatly instead of allowing for the stroke input of every character lin limited the strokes to just two the first component on the top of the character and the last component on the bottom of the character. This was something that every literate Chinese person knew and it would be very intuitive for them to use this machine. This typewriter looked almost the same as that of an English language typewriter and the size and weight were comparable as well, except there was one major difference. The space above the keyboard housed a large cylinder made up of six medium cylinders 
each of which housed six small cylinders. Each of the six small cylinders had eight sides, and each side had 29 character casts. In total, this allowed for 8,352 characters to be typed. The absolute ingenious part of this machine is the selection process. For example, if you want to type out the character Xin, you'd first tap the top part, which is the Ren Zipang, and then you type the bottom part, which is the Kou. The cylinders in the device have now turned to find the characters that match the top and bottom component. Next, a viewfinder called the Magic Eye lights up on the top of the machine, showing you eight possible options matching Ren Zipang and then Kou. From there, there are eight buttons on the bottom of the keypad, and you strike the number of the character you want. The rest of the machine functions exactly the same as an English language typewriter. However, that is not where this ingenious typewriter stopped. Out of the over 8,000 characters in the cylinders, about 7,000 are full characters. But of the remaining 1,370 casts, 1,300 are phonetic components and 70 are radicals which means that a total of 91,000 additional characters can be made from this machine. What Lin Yutang created was an absolute linguistic and engineering marvel. However, a variety of factors prevented him from becoming the household name he deserved to be. First, when he demonstrated the machine to Remington executives in New York, a malfunction in the machine caused them to take a pass. Lin tried to shop the machine around to several different other companies, but in the minds of many, the civil war that had unfurled in China at that point made taking on the machine a huge financial risk. In the end, bankrupt from spending almost 120,000 US dollars of his own money to making the prototype, Lin eventually sold the rights of the machine to the Mergenthaler Linotype Company. However, Mergenthaler didn't want to mass produce it. They simply wanted it to study its keyboard and its character storage system. The machine was later acquired by the US Air Force. The late 1900s was a time in which computers were taking off and the US government wanted an in on storing and retrieving Chinese information. Much of the logic of the Ming Kuai typewriter was incorporated into one of the first Chinese computers ever made, the Sinotype, created by MIT engineer Thomas Caldwell. Although Ming's magnificent device never saw the light of day, the logic behind the Ming Kuai typewriter is now immortalized in the way we store and retrieve Chinese characters on our computers, and our mobile devices. In particular, it was during this time that the Chinese language was undergoing serious scrutiny. The 1800s and the 1900s brought us the telegram, the typewriter, and the computer, all of which were designed with Latin-based Western languages in mind. The Chinese language, with its inscrutable character system, seemed at odds with modernization. Many strongly believe that unless the Chinese language dropped characters altogether in favor of a Latin-based alphabet, that the country would completely perish in the modern world. But it's those, like the protagonists of today's story, firm believers of the Chinese language, that help Chinese characters survive to this very day. And for that, I couldn't be more grateful. Thank you for going on this super long journey with me. I had planned to make a video on Chinese fonts, and in the process, I'd stumbled upon the as interesting, if not more interesting story of the Chinese typewriter. A big thanks has to go to Dr. Jing Su for writing the amazing book, Kingdom of Characters. It's a moving story about the underdogs that try to preserve the Chinese language in the 20th century, and I highly recommend you read it. Additionally, huge thanks goes out to Dr. Thomas Mullaney, a historian who has covered Chinese computers and typewriters for many years in his career. He wrote two books aptly titled The Chinese Typewriter and The Chinese Computer, which both are available for sale, and I highly recommend you read it if you're interested in those topics. I also have to thank each and every person who has photographed, videographed, or written about Chinese typewriters, especially the ones that were mentioned in this video, they have really helped me to understand how these typewriters work. I tried to credit them all and you can find them in the description of this video. Thank you again for watching this video. I've made quite a few videos about Chinese up until this point, but this video has really moved me the most. I really marveled at the mechanisms created by these inventors and my heart's broke when their plans for the typewriters didn't go as planned. It's my hope that through this video, the legacy of them and their typewriters can be carried just a little bit further. See you next time.